Any minute now, the bats are gonna leave from this cave. The locals have brought their implements. When the bats come out, we're only gonna have about 10 minutes and then they're gone and then our opportunity is lost. Here we go. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. What do you know about Laotian cuisine? That is food from the country of Laos. With a mixture of indigenous traditions, its French colonial past, and its neighboring Asian influences, cracking this complex culinary code is not so easy. Is it vital that the shrimp be alive? When it's alive, it's more fun. I thought she was gonna say fresh. She said it's more fun to eat this way because they're still alive. So let's start with what makes Laos unlike anywhere else on earth. Laos is Southeast Asia's only landlocked country, surrounded by Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, and China. It's densely packed with diverse ethnic groups, the largest being the Lao people. Have you ever seen the ocean? <laughs> Followed by the Khmu. We don't have writing language, only speaking. And finally, the Hmong. The enthusiasm in this village is wild. This blend of cultures, coupled with the country's vast biodiversity and rich landscapes, fuels a uniquely varied and vibrant food culture. And I, I'm in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, this is raspberry jello. This is raspberry jello. <laughs> oh, that's a pretty conservative spoonful. Yeah, I mean, you know, before we can run, we have to crawl, right? Starting in Laos's capital of Vientiane, then heading deep into the northern mountains to join isolated tribes. We're on a mission to uncover Laotian food you can't find on any menu, like countryside markets. Dude, it's like looking at me. Where the meat section just might be filled with whatever local villagers caught in the wild Does it bite? the night before. It definitely bites. Dude, why am I on this side? Um, uh, security? If you make it to the Mekong River, oh, is that shrimp? Locals can show you how they live off the land. They can live without money. And the water. Oh, here we go. Catching fresh crabs, they prefer to eat not just whole, but also oh. alive. There are fuzzy forest dwelling rodents from innocent squirrels transformed into a tasty soup. What I love most notably is this right here, a squirrel tail. All the way to massive burrowing rats. These things can get up to this big. What the heck, that's a beaver. In the north, unexploded bombshells contain the fires that cook our meals. Somebody tried to kill the people here with this, and they're like, we can use it. And purple sticky rice transforms into something beautiful. Oh, this is right here what I want to eat. But not without a little bit of effort. How old school is this? The Hmong word is yua, but it's almost like a mochi. Oh my gosh, my shoulders starting to feel it. Joining me on my Laos food journey, Hmong American chef Yia Vang. Yia's parents are both from Laos, but after the Vietnam War, at a time when Hmong people who assisted American troops were being hunted down, they both narrowly escaped to a refugee camp in Thailand. This is where Yia was born. At a young age, his family got the chance to move to the USA. Now, Yia spreads Hmong culture through his food. When it comes to Hmong food, it's about simplicity. It's about what can I do with the resources that I have around me and how do I make something out of that? This journey will be his first time traveling to Laos. We were able to get in contact with your mom's cousin. Are you serious? Reconnecting with the land his parents called home. Whether he likes it oh. or not. Keep it up, keep it up. Oh, it's biting me! Ah, it's in the eye! Oh my God! Here, Yia will discover food flavors. Don't let our food escape. That can't be found on the shelves of your average Asian grocery store. It's like a citrus burst. Like the Kumu people's fondness for bat meat. I wonder if Yia will decide to incorporate this new ingredient onto his menu in Minnesota. Collected from the mouth of a cave. It is a mesmerizing, confusing creature. Then cooked up the traditional way. Together, we're on a quest to uncover the most unique. Definitely, it's an acquired taste. That means he doesn't like it that much. Most captivating food stories this country has to offer. Bamboo rat liver, we'll see if it tastes like bamboo. But this journey is about more than just food. It's about the people, the traditions, and the connections. Coming back here, it's like coming to a home that I've never been to, but I feel like I belong, you know? And it all starts here in the NTN. 
Gia. Sunny. Welcome to Laos. Thanks, man. Today, our focus is street food in this city. Yes. In the heart of Laos, there's a dish that embodies the very essence of this vibrant nation. A dish we've come to try here at Auntie Chits. A tantalizing street food eatery with clay pots packed with powerful flavors. Each one part of a combination of spices that will give your taste buds a knockout punch. This right here is a bowl of, do you know the name? Long way, we say a kopong. Should we dive in? Yeah, let's do this. I'm so excited, dude. Veggies, coriander, and bean sprouts. Vermicelli noodles and bits of sliced organ meats and sliced liver all come together in perfect harmony. The rich broth made from boiled pork bones and skin is topped off with fresh coriander and herbs. If you don't mind, try to do like certain body parts together. Yeah, I, yeah the food, right? Not yeah. us, okay. I think we should start right here with the uh, blood cake. Cheers. Yeah, cheers, bro. Mm. That's a good blood cake. That was really good. It's just an explosion of savoriness. The texture is so good. I'm weird because I like that little irony taste to it. Yeah, that when it mixes with this incredibly savory broth is so delicious. Oh, it's so heartwarming. Yep. I'm back in Southeast Asia, baby. It's hard to explain except for it's just a deep, delicious savoriness. I'm pretty sure there's bones in there. To get that rich umphness, can we go this? Yeah, that's like yeah. intestine, right? That's more of the end part of the intestines, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, I love it, dude. Oh my God. I can't believe how soft these intestines are. At our restaurant, we just call this the good good, you know? What's wild is this dish right here is about two bucks. It's mind blowing. You know what I was thinking too? If you had too many adult drinks the night before, this is the best in the morning. Hangover cure. Yeah. Growing up, did you ever have something like this for breakfast? We actually did. My mom and dad would say, would you like the American way? Which is like your eggs, rice, whatever. The American way, you know, eggs and rice. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Hmong American way, you know? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Before we leave this restaurant, yeah. chicken feet. These chicken feet, or phoenix claws, are braised for hours until their scaly skin becomes soft. Mmm. Oh, man. It's yeah. a great drinking food because mm -hmm. it takes time. You have to gnaw at it, but it's oh, full yeah. of flavor. Like, this has a deep, delicious yeah. spiciness. It's like a glowing heat in your mouth. Oh, this thing's amazing. Initially, you were actually born in Southeast Asia. I was born in a refugee camp. It was called Ban Binai, 10 kilometers off of the Lao Thai border. Our family lived there till 88, and we left to Minnesota, actually. But you haven't been back since. Yep. So why do you want to join me on this trip? My parents always talk about home. I think it's really good for me to go and see where I'm from and discovering, you know, all these things that I've only heard in stories. Now I can actually experience it. Well, we have a lot of experiences in front of us, some that are going to be fun and make you reflect and make you maybe uh, nostalgic, and some that might be not so comfortable. How excited, brother. Soon our Laotian food tour will take us to some of this country's most remote villages. Oh my gosh. But to start, where better than Laos's capital? Nestled along the meandering Mekong River, the NTN effortlessly blends a rich history with a dash of modernity, a city where the warmth of its people is matched only by the tantalizing aroma of its street food. Food here has influences from Thai and Vietnamese to French and Chinese, and around every turn there's a new culinary surprise, like that which awaits us at our next destination. This Laotian salad is made with minced meat that's often served raw. And then put together with the food. I'm sorry, put it together with one? Uh, I know how, to, how do you call that one with the... The bile, right? Yeah, the bile. This is Vientian native Mina, and today she'll be helping us connect with the locals. But where's the bile coming from? Some chai is the owner of this street side lob eatery. Uh-huh, in the cow stomach. Bile, or ki ong, roughly translates to soft, Pool. This often discarded digestive fluid is a coveted cooking ingredient in this country. If our first location was comfort food, I would consider this discomfort food. Our lob today starts with raw beef, trimmed then laboriously minced by hand. Once ready, it's mixed with boiled tripe and sliced liver. Now for the flavor. Chili powder, rice powder, MSG, fish sauce, gastric acid, and green bile. For a burst of freshness, we've got bean sprouts, coriander, and mint. Garnish with pieces of raw stomach. Cheers. What hits you first? The bile. Mm. It's so bitter. As I chew it and work it down, it slowly disappears. It does start bitter, but it was well balanced with the other ingredients they put inside of it. I love that. That texture, the heat. Oh, yeah. Beautiful spices. There is this base of bitterness. Very apparent. Definitely is. 
that said, not something I would eat every week. No, this is a specialty thing. And it's kind of like a symbol of luckiness. Does this taste similar to lob you grew up eating? Yes, minus the bile. So how is that for you, having that punch of bitterness? It's not like my first go-to, but I'm not mad at it. Right here, this is not lob, but it is soy juice. Lob's less refined cousin. It's made by slicing the same raw beef and liver into uncomfortably large chunks, then tossing them with fresh coriander and mint into a piece of raw stomach. Think of it like a buffalo sashimi roll. It looks like a little mouth. It does. <laughs> it does. This doesn't have all those seasonings and liquids added yep. in. Instead, we have to dip it right here ourselves. This right here is a delightful dipping sauce made of shit. Here's how it works. Buffalo bile is produced in the cow's liver and then secreted into the first section of the small intestine. That sauce of the gods is extracted, but not quite ready to consume. So it's gonna be a mixture of digestive juices along with whatever the cow was eating. We're not gonna eat this raw. The intestinal contents are boiled, then filtered to remove any impurities. Yeah. But you're still eating essentially cooked poop. All right, I'm gonna give it a generous dip, man. Cheers. Wow, man, that will wake you up in the morning. It is just such a powerful mm -hmm. punch of flavor. The lime leaf is what really protects that bile from being like bio -y, you know? That bitterness, it's balanced with the freshness of these leaves, but it's just like adding intensity to intensity. Growing up, the most iconic dish that my father ever made is lob. So like for me, trying lob this way, it's a little different than the way the dad did it, but it's still very homecoming welcoming to me. One more. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> In this modern age, it's best not to bring your work home with you. But our next fearless food vendor just can't help it. We're entering the home of VNTN's premier bug seller. Here, she's preparing bowls of exotic offerings that will soon go to market. Meet Ms. Samdun. Ma'am? Good day. No, I'm not Do you know what's so cool? As we show it up, she had just shaken these ant eggs out of this tree. No way. Yeah. How long have you had an ant tree in your backyard? This year is the first time that she collected. Oh. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> like, that's so interesting. This must be five, six pounds of pure ant eggs with a handful of ticked off ants still running around trying to figure out what went wrong I just know. now. They were like, this is some kind of a natural disaster or a global warming, climate change. <laughs> <laughs> you deserve that. Here, take it away. It smells like uh, roasted peanuts. These are stink bugs. Really? Yeah. If you mix it and mash it, it will have the very nice smell. These are probably familiar to you. What are they? These are the pupa of the cicada. Finally, these are cicadas. So where do you find these? In the nighttime and then collect it from the leaves. So they have to shine them. That's right. That's what we do with the kangaroo in Australia. Were they in the trees though? No, but you have to shine them. <laughs> yeah. Right here, we have some cicadas that you just grilled. To make this dish, first she removes the cicada's wings. Then she adds her simple, straightforward seasoning blend, pork powder, MSG, and salt. Skewer them up and grill them over charcoal for a crispy, crunchy treat. That's a beautiful color of a roasting on yeah. it. Here, I'm sorry, you don't have one. <laughs> have you ever had this before? Um, I can't remember. Oh, fantastic. I have a feeling you'll remember this time. <laughs> that being said, let's try it out. No way. It makes me nervous when they don't try it. It's oh. delicious. It's not gushy, but it has like a little bit of sweet moisture inside, mm -hmm. almost like a smoky corn flavor. What do you think it tastes like? <laughs> she said it doesn't taste good. Oh. <laughs> do you see the hesitation was real? Is it the cook or is it the ingredient or is it just your personal preference? Nah, she doesn't like it personally. I like it because it has everything. It has that sweetness, it has a smokiness, it has textural crunch. This will be so good with the beer lao. That's what I love. How many different types of bugs do you sell? Yeah, me, the, me, the, 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 it depends on the season. And then for this season, it will be like skeda and the stink bugs and honeycomb. Miss Samaidu doesn't just source bugs from her garden, but from all around the country. Usually that is we get it from Siang Kuang and then Luang Prabang and also in Sam Nua. These bugs are carefully collected and shipped to her by, by plane. plane. Oh. By plane. Every day after preparing her buggy bounty, our gracious, grub-wielding host brings her offerings here to Nongyang Market. This maze of dimly lit tables is sensory overload, a riot of colors with earthy red chili peppers, vibrant fruits, and lush green vegetables showcasing the treasures of Laotian soil. The aromas are dizzying, some pleasant and some not so pleasant. Among the hawkers and vendors, Ms. Samdun is the only one offering bug species from around the country. The number and type of insects offered vary depending on the season. 
kind of like truffles. Another bug that's right here encased within this bamboo. What is it? These are called magic bugs. I'm not sure why they call them that. Magic bugs, also known as stink bugs, are considered an exotic dish in many parts of the world because their pungent odor often deters people from trying them. But no odor has ever stopped me. Each tube has about eight to 10 bugs. Many of them are still alive. I know, because they're moving. Yeah, right. That's a great indicator of life. Can these bugs sting you or bite you or hurt you? <laughs> no. Do you know what we're doing next? We're pouring live bugs onto our fermented veggies and then we're eating them. I'm told these have a strong, distinctive taste. Is that right? Especially for the male bugs. The taste is similar to wasabi. But this is a female one, it tastes very sweet. Oh, you ready? Yeah, let's do it. Oh, cinnamon. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a strong flavor. Yeah, that's really good. It's like a perfume I tasted through my nostrils, like right up here. Oh, that's so good. Mmm. It stings a little bit, but it's like a brief moment of sting. That is one of the most stunning, unique tastes I've ever experienced in my life. I, oh, I, the stingy. The Good sting, burn, yeah. That's the male one, right? Yeah, that's right. Got a dude. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> I'm so fascinated by this because this requires marketing. How do you educate people here? Um, from the beginning, they wonder about, oh, what this kind of bamboo shoot? And then she explained to them and also telling them what they should eat with, like with the fermented veggie. One of the things that's super amazing about this table is most people's tables and stalls, they're like shooing the bug away. Here, it's normal. Yeah, you know? what the heck? There's a fly on my bug. <laughs> This is the honey comb. This may look familiar, but it doesn't contain any honey, and it's certainly not sweet. It's sticky, oh. it's gooey, and you can see oh. the pupa inside. Oh, dang! This is a brood comb, the place where the queen lays her eggs and where they develop into larvae. The stranded larvae and their home is wrapped in a banana leaf, then grilled over an open flame. So there's something waxy here. If I take a bite, do I need to spit out the wax? So you just take a big bite. And swallow the whole thing? That's right. Oh! Okay. It's sour, it's like weirdly chewy, there's little popping pupas. How do you like it? And it's not my, you know, favorite. Dude, if you don't like it, just say you don't like it. Is this something you like? Mark. Yeah. See, that's what I love about this lady. She's yeah. so honest, because early on, she was like... She said it doesn't taste good. Even though she sells it. After eating live bugs, I'm on the search for one more food that could finally pluck Yia out of his comfort zone oh. and plant him in his new reality here in Laos. Something tells me I found the right place. We have come to our final location. This is a duck restaurant. They're specializing in all things duck, and let me tell you, they use every part of the body. Once you select the duck, they will ask you if you want the blood or not. If you do, they will make a special dish made from fresh duck blood that is served completely raw. That's what we're gonna be trying in just a moment here, but first, I need to pick a duck. Ooh, I like that one. Every duck sacrificed here is utilized in its entirety, from its head to its webbed feet. But the most coveted consumable calories come from the blood. Feet, head, I'm good with. This is new. You've had this before, Mina, right? Yeah. And did you enjoy it? This is very good. It tastes nice. But first, we have roasted duck right here. The duck is boiled, cleaned, butchered, and grilled over hot coals and paired with pungent sauces and fresh herbs. This morning, we started with chicken feet, now grilled duck feet. Yeah, let's do it. Can we get a high five? Yeah, cheers. Yeah. It still has the fingernail on there. Oh, I love that. You know why? Why? I hope you pick stuff out of your teeth. That's a great point. The best part about eating the duck feet, of course, is like this leathery skin between each toe. Oh yeah, it's like fried chips. It has a great texture to it. This is very different from what we had this morning. I can see why this is incredible drinking food. Come here, drink about 15 gigantic beers, and then chill. This is like communal style Southeast Asian dining that I love and I treasure. And if the feet are not enough for you, they have this right here, the head. Oh, the duck tongue. Yeah, I got half a tongue on mine. That's where it's about. This is really good too. Right here, we have our blood dish. By now it's kind of coagulated. What's interesting is it's not just the blood. That's right. It's starting from the beginning when they slaughter the uh, duck. The blood of the freshly slaughtered animal is mixed with water and fish sauce, preventing it from coagulating too quickly. 
but any good blood jello is gonna need some fillings. Here, it'll be in the form of fried skin, meat, and organs. So that they have like liver in there and also some of the intestine. In a separate bowl, they mix blood with water. So they have the ratio of this. One bowl of blood to two bowls of water. If you mix it right, then you can get the blood clot like this. That mixture is poured over the meat. Finally, garnish with lemongrass, mint, coriander, peanuts, and shallots, and allowed to set over the next few minutes. So when you look at this, is there anything about this dish that's intimidating to you? I think it's just the blood itself. Well, we did have blood this morning. I'm weird because I like that little irony taste to it. It's good, it's a blood cake. This is a lot less cakey, a lot more jello-y. I think we should just dig into it. Yeah. I'm gonna hit it with a little bit of lime. I think you just wanna get as many chunks as possible. Oh, that has some drippy parts. Oh. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Oh yeah, fried shallots, crunchy organ meats, super crunchy peanuts. Right away when you put it in your mouth, it's like a, a really gentle jello that almost liquefies immediately. Not a very bloody taste to it. Yeah, because when I think of blood, I think of that very iron metallic taste, and that's what I was really nervous about. It's half texture and a half flavor, because the herbs in here, it's so aromatic, you can just taste it through your nose. Is it the taste or the texture that's getting to you? My brain goes right to like the bloody nose, you know, like football helmet, and that's all I can think of right now while eating that. Even though the flavor is Awesome. Mina, you hardly touched your blood. No, I did. Okay. I'm pretty good. Stop bullying me. <laughs> well, this city is really fascinating to me. It's the biggest city in the country. This is like the metropolis for Laos. What are people usually doing at nighttime? Sometimes we have like restaurants and then they might go out during Friday night, meet with their friends and also find some other food. Food, music drinking. These are universal things. One of the questions I keep thinking about is for you personally, like what is your hope for Vientiane? I think I want to see some change, but then somehow I also want to see some of the slow life. Now we start to see that people are rushing all the time, but then somehow they also forget about what they have right now. Or where they came from. That's right. Drive north of the NTN, you'll find this village, home to members of this country's largest ethnic minority group, the Kamu people. The Kamu are known as subsistence farmers. They grow crops, but they also forage, gather, and hunt. Dude, it's like looking at me. Does it bite? Yes. An extensive knowledge of this land, combined with resourcefulness, makes for an incredibly unique diet. They have it for uh, like a few times. It tastes very good. Today, we're going deep into the unbelievable eating habits of the Kamu people, including bat. Dude, wow, that is a tiny, tiny bat. Stop, you weirdo. I'm on a mission to see how a bat hunt works. The fun part is I'm going to be right under the stream of bats as they come out. The other fun part is bats shit continuously and how those bats are prepared for consumption oh my gosh you're still looking at me before diving into the world of these petite vampires Yi and i test the water with some very local menu items starting with food on a stick that you won't find at any state fair first is a pig tongue right i've never had pig tongue like this serious? these pig tongues take a wild ride from boiling to marinating in lemongrass garlic salt msg and sugar before getting clamped into a bamboo stick and grilling to a shining brown hue you can see it's like a sheen coming off the meat almost like a glaze Oh man, mm -hmm. I love it. It's not about being tender mm -hmm. or soft, it's just got a really satisfying chew to it that you love to bite through. And then on the outside, it's like a little savory, a little sweet, just a little hints of flavor, but just meaty and delicious. You know what I love about this dude is the treatment of this is very simple. Oh man, that smoke, giving it a kiss. Yum, 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 yum. Yum, yum, yum. yum, yum, yum. <laughs> the master cook behind this tongue twisting delight, Miss Bang, with over 25 years of experience at the grill. How many different types of meats are you selling at your stall? You make a bee, the bee, the birds, the fish. Grill duck, grill pork, and grill fish. Go fish twice? Yeah. That's a lot of fish. One of Miss Bang's best sellers is this tiny wild bird. They're stuffed with garlic, spring onion, MSG, salt, and sugar, then tossed over charcoal. Do we eat every part of the body? We just eat all. 
<laughs> you gotta be careful, man. It's like eating a piece of jerky with random toothpicks inside. With that texture, though. Oh, it's so good. It's delicious. I just got the head, all mm -hmm. the brain and head fluids just squirted out in my mouth, and they taste delicious. I'm fascinated by this, you know, because the bamboo doesn't burn when you grill. You know, if you use the skewer and you grill this, the skewer will burn, and then all the food will fall off. But this, this is ingenuity. As a cook, I am really excited about the way that she makes it. It's beautiful. I just have a feeling it would be like if she came to the USA and she was like, this fork, I'm so excited about this fork. And you'd be like, all right. Joining me, Hmong American chef Yia Vang. Having spent most his life in the USA, Yia has wholly embraced his mission to reconnect with his motherland. These are called magic bugs. The stingy. The bug, yeah. Oh, that's so good. But now that we're outside the city, things are just beginning to heat up. This is kind of a chili or a pepper. Can you tell me what's inside? Lemongrass, garlic, and liquid of fermented fish. I've had something like this before when I was in Cambodia. It's called brahok. And they have big piles of it. You go to the market, the oh, yeah. smell is incredible. It's pungent. And they go, oh, it's Cambodian cheese. Let me tell you something. That ain't cheese. But it is strong and potent. But here, it looks like it's mixed with a lot of flavors. Oh. I love that funk. Oh yeah, this is Laotian jalapeno poppers right here. That's what yeah. I was thinking. <laughs> it's super spicy. She's kind of oiled it up on the outside, mm -hmm. and then inside, just tons of herbaceous spices yeah. mixed with that creamy, fermented, pungent cheese. Yeah. It's almost like a cream mm -hmm. cheese in the middle. That is wild. When we get back to America, I'm gonna try making something like this. Yeah. This is so delicious. This bank opened her stall 12 years ago, adding her scrumptious skewers to the vibrant tapestry of this market. This bustling market lures locals and visitors with a kaleidoscope of offerings. Kitchenware, affordable furniture, piles of fresh vegetables, and loads of irresistible street food. But what truly sets this place apart is the daring selection of meat. For example, bamboo rat, squirrel, porcupine. They're porcupine. They're porcupine. Maybe not every day, yeah. but... Not every day, but they have it here. And also they have yeah. mouse meat, lizard, and some other... Wow. Soon, he and I will visit a Kamu home for a bat meat meal. Is it head first or butt first? But it's polite to show up with a welcome gift. And what better than some exotic meats carefully chosen from this lively market? Oh, look at that guy. Is this a tortoise or like a water turtle? Like a water turtle. They have it for like a few times. The taste very good. I've had turtle a few times, and most recently we experienced some sea turtle in Australia, and I'm good with turtle for about a year after that. So luckily, the turtle is safe for today. It's peeing on you. Oh, that's... <laughs> I have pooped! <laughs> in this Camus-dominated town, the protein selection is a reflection of the people's hunting prowess and a testament to their adventurous culinary spirit. In other words, if it moves, They'll eat it. Oh, that one's alive. Like this monitor lizard. Dude, it's like looking at me. Does it bite? Yes. Dude, why am I on this side? Is there one under the table too? Nope, nope, nope. Let's not play that game. <laughs> How would you cook this? Mostly this we make like a salad. <laughs> you wouldn't think in the US it's like cob salad, Caesar salad. Yeah. Here it's like, uh, oh, that could be a salad. Yeah, it's really looking at me, dude. Yeah, well, it's in this pre-salad state. Here we have squirrels. Mostly that if you get it from the forest, they use a trap to cut it. I love squirrels. We cook it in our diets all the time. People go squirrel hunting in Minnesota. I tried once, there were no squirrels left. The final food, whoosh. What's that? What's your guess? I have no idea. It's not a spit, it's a... Sparrow? It's a swallow. Swallow. Oh. Wait, it's not a spit, it's a sparrow. English is my second language, That was dude. a riddle. <laughs> these are fermented swallows. How long are these fermented? I didn't know. Uh, they take for one week. Mostly they fermented with salt, sesame, MSG, and also some dry chili. Because the people here, they believe that when they ferment it, make more salty and make more flavor. I mean, you think about it, it's kind of like, you know, uh, corned beef. There is a little preservation to it, but it adds all that flavor. Intrigued by the color possibilities that fermented swallows and monitor lizards may hold, I purchased them both for a future meal. But the real showstopper is right here. Oh, more birds? <laughs> Those ain't birds. <laughs> Those are bats. Oh, vampire looking faces, dude. Yeah, they have kind of like little mouse heads yeah. and big floppy ears, furry heads. Oh gosh, the wings are almost like, they're leathery, but they're almost like silky, super thin. You can see the little bones inside. This is the bird of the devil. Stop, you weirdo. It musty, like a little bit like pee pee. How common is it for people to eat bats in this area? Mostly these are also very good meat because people, they're living here and then they cannot buy anything. They don't have money to buy. Then they have to cut this for themselves. If they get more and more, then they're just selling to each other. Sounds like it's very affordable. I mean, is this cheap? to buy? I did cheap for local here. Bat eating in different corners of Asia isn't common, but it does happen in small pockets here and there. 
take Toma Hone, Indonesia, a place infamous for consuming giant fruit bats. Look how huge this is. Four to five dollars for a whole bat. Batman Robin. Batman, you're Robin? However, in the West, bats have long been cast as vampiric creatures, omens of doom, and something you generally shouldn't put in your mouth. With the amplification of COVID propaganda, these flying rodents find themselves shrouded in taboo. Ever since COVID, do less people eat bats? It's most everybody that they eat the bat. They still eat the bat. Yeah. I'm not gonna say this looks delicious, but I certainly want to learn more. So I say tonight we go caving, batting, spelunking. I don't know what you want to call it. Spelunking. And uh, we see the catch for ourselves. We've just ascended the mountain. This is uh, actually like a karst jutting from the landscape here. It took about 30 minutes to get one third of the way up. And we actually had to come through the cave to come here outside the cave. Inside of here, thousands and thousands, maybe millions of bats. In about an hour, a load of bats are gonna come spewing out of this cave mouth. When the bats come out, we're only gonna have about 10 minutes from beginning to end, and then they're gone, and then our opportunity is lost. Right now, we're setting up. The locals have brought their implements, their tools. They have a very simple but effective strategy for catching the bats. Let's take a look now. It's a very simple process. They have two long bamboo poles and they have a net, kind of a mesh in between. So these two gentlemen are taking some twine, connecting the net firmly to the bamboo, and then it's kind of self-evident from there. They hold it up and they wait for the bats to fly directly into the net. Problems, potential issues. The opening to this cave is huge. This is big, but it's not as big as the cave mouth. Are the bats gonna see this? Are they gonna pick it up on their sonar? Are they just gonna drive around it? I'm not sure. Any minute now, the bats are gonna leave from this cave. Somehow I got volunteered to help. The fun part is I'm gonna be right under the stream of bats as they come out. The other fun part is bats continuously. This whole area just smells like a stadium bathroom. It's just like ammonia, musty guana. It's brutal. And so soon, that's gonna be on top of me. Funny as this scenario may sound, bat guano, the fancy term for bad shit, can pack a deadly punch with a lung disease known as histoplasmosis. Bats have just started coming out of the cave, but we've been instructed to sit down and not make any big movements. We want them to fly out for at least a couple miles straight, so they've established kind of a path in which to move, and then we can make our move. For now, we're just sitting, waiting, and this stream gets thicker and thicker. I just got pooped on as well. Very cool. Okay guys, here we go. As the air thickens with frenzied flutter, we rush to set up our net, aiming to trap as many bats as possible while most of these clever, sonar-guided bats dodge and weave their way around the net. Oh, come on. Flying too high. You got about 20 in there. In just a few minutes, the final bat will leave the cave and our time will have run out. All right, all right, all right, we're good. We're good, we're fully loaded. So. There's probably 80 in here right now. They are buried and tangled in there and they've got little claws and they're gonna fish them out one by one. They're putting it in a bag in a little gunny sack and then we're gonna count how many we have soon. All right, some minutes have gone by. These gentlemen are still behind me picking bats out of the net. They started with the gloves and they're like, forget the gloves. They need to have their grip. They need to be able to gently and with nuance feel for the bat and grab onto it. Now I've got one right here. This one was about to get away and I bravely grabbed it with my gloved hand. You know, I understand when I was in Indonesia, they get big fruit bats. Those things weigh like nine pounds. That's meat on there. But this thing, this is so tiny. It's smaller than that bird we ate today. So it kind of baffles my mind that people go through all this work and potential danger just to eat something like this. So all the bats we collected are right here. It is very disconcerting. And they're squeaking like little mice. Out of those millions and millions of bats we've got, I'm gonna go with 50. I thought it was maybe 80 or 100. I gotta be honest, during the collection process, some of them flew away. So, oh, sorry, I'm not, what? I'm not wearing a glove. I don't need a glove. The locals don't wear gloves. Why would I have a glove? So we have our bats collected. It is evening time right now, but tomorrow, we're gonna wake up early and go to a local family's house where we're gonna cook up these same bats. The Kamu are the second largest ethnic group in Laos, making up 11% of the nation's population. 
Their presence in this country dates back 10,000 years. While Kamu populations can be found in China, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam, the majority still dwell in their ancestral homeland of northern Laos, where small communities like Na Pung Village thrive. Gentlemen, take a look at this bag of bats. This is soon gonna be dinner. How long will they stay fresh? For a few days. They'll stay alive for a few days. All right, I'm gonna put that down for now. And, uh... <laughs> I feel like you need to just put it all over your face too and like everywhere. <laughs> For an authentic bat meat experience, we'll tease our palates with the daring dance of exotic meats purchased from yesterday's market tour. Chili, lemongrass, garlic, shallots, mountain peppers, scallion, and MSG, all smashed into a paste. Mix that paste with fermented swallows. When this is fermented, how long can it last? Then wrap them up with a few layers of banana leaves. Five months. That's incredible. I mean, when you're out here, when there's no refrigeration, this is exactly how you know it has to be done to preserve food. Each bundle is clamped into bamboo skewers and tossed on the grill. We had birds yesterday. These are much more dainty, small than that. The bones are thin, but they're also hollow. And so you can crunch right through them pretty easily. Do they rip out the guts or not? No. So whatever this bird ate, we're gonna also eat. Hmm, it has a slightly bitter taste to it. Mm -hmm. Now, is that the bug spray I just put on my hand? No, probably that too. Ooh, that has a very different flavor from anything we've had so far. All the organs are still in there and it really creates an immensely bitter taste that lasts and lasts. It's like drinking the blackest coffee ever after you brush your teeth. Intensely, <clears throat> deeply bitter. Yeah, but I like that though. You like it? Yeah. I think like what we've really learned on this trip so far is like that bitterness. What hits you first? The bile is so bitter. And this is just part of the flavor profile of a lot of these people here in the mountains. Uh, no. Yeah, they believe that when we eat uh, like the bio inside, it make them like more flavor, make more energy. Kids also enjoy the bitter also flavor. Enjoy, can eat a better flavor. It makes complete sense. No. It's as normal as for American kids eating cheeseburgers and pizza. But I think that what I love about this food is it has all the complexity of all the different flavors. Even though the sparrow has that little hint of bitterness, if I grab some herb or if mm. I grab some more sticky rice, it helps balance it out. And so they don't need to be afraid of this. But to really learn that food is about balance. Yeah, mic drop. Preparations for our big meal have begun. The ladies conquer the bats, and the men tango with a monitor lizard. Both creatures sizzle over fire, one shedding in scaly armor, and the other torched in a fiery inferno. Initially with this recipe, I heard they're just gonna boil the bats. That to me didn't seem like aggressive enough. Now they're torching the bats, getting all the hair off, and you know, just burning off any little germies. What I love is there's this trio of women behind me looking like they've done this a million times before. It's basically like they're making s'mores over the fire. And the same rules apply. You can't torch it, can't keep it there too long. And if you do, just blow it out. Next, each of these winged rats is chopped in half. Meanwhile, the cooking crew is also busy portioning the lizard meat and boiling its skin to their desired softness. Whether it's cooking, farming, or hunting, the Kamu people thrive on the essence of teamwork like this. Unity is crucial when most of the tribe lives in small, isolated villages. Is there electricity that comes out here? For me, say, uh, say, no say. electricity here. They use the solar panel. So it's completely off the grid. It's not connected to any other part of any infrastructure. In fact, it seems like the only way people really get around are these two-wheel tractors that pull a wagon behind, right? Just for moving the people, for carrying the wood and planting. For the rice paddy, just as like a buffalo. The Camus' preferred site for a village is at the base of mountains and in forest valleys. These geographic features, plus the strategic proximity to the mighty Mekong River, unwittingly transformed towns like Na Pung into pivotal battlegrounds during the tumultuous Vietnam War, where Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam united in fierce resistance against the U.S. Army. I've heard this name many times, you know, Nam Pung. Like, my, my dad is like, that's our old battlegrounds. At the age of 12, Yi's father was recruited to work alongside American troops in a 1961-1975 anti-communist CIA operation known as the Secret War. So my father and his guys were using the river to cross back and forth, uh, running secret missions in from Thailand to Laos. So like the grandfather, he was part of the Red Lao Army that fought against my dad in this town that we're in. When the Communist Party, Patet Lao, emerged triumphant, the Hmong people who fought for the USA were labeled as the nation's traitors 
and they were doomed to death sentences. Yi's parents spent months hiding in the jungle, inching toward the Thai border, desperately escaping their homeland. Last night when we were walking up to the bat cave, I just thought about my mom's story about how they had to go hide in a cave. And I just kept thinking to myself, well, they didn't have flashlights, they didn't have anything. Right. And they just went through the dark. And they hid in that cave for over eight days. And she said that they were so hungry, they would dig for roots on trees, they would chew on that, just so that you can create saliva, so you can swallow the saliva as your water. Do you think your father would be able to come back to a place like this? Not logistically, emotionally. I don't know, but I know that this was home for him. Yeah, I remember my dad was asked once, like, are you mad at the war? You know, are you mad at the Americans for leaving you guys behind? And the only way he answered it was he said, it was a war. You can't control what happens. You can only control in your actions in that moment, and you have to keep moving on. So I can't come back here and be mad at stuff. I, I can't hold anything. Different time, different war. But I recognize the fact of what's happened. And these were the people fighting against your dad. Yeah. And we're among them now. Yes, but I think that here's the deal, man. I think that that's the greatest thing about food. Like. My father, my grandfather, some of the fathers and the grandfathers here probably fought against each other 40, 50 years ago. And now we're sitting as, as my dad's son, I'm sitting at the same table with them. As once was enemy, now can sit down as friends and comrades eating together. Guys, impressive meal. Can we try some of this lizard, please? So I was watching them make this, the process of making this lizard, and it's basically kind of like how I've seen my dad make lob. Lob is a traditional Laotian salad made with various spices and minced meat. In this case, minced lizard meat. Salt, MSG, and garlic. Join the meat in a wok for a little bit of sizzle. This is so interesting because I remember my dad once telling me about how they would hunt for these lizards in the jungle as a boy. And I'm here right now experiencing it, experiencing everything that he's talked about. So in this moment, I'm just kind of like embracing it and taking it in. Stir-fried lizard meat reunites with its skin, which is now boiled and cut into thin strips. Add rice powder, chili powder, lime juice, fresh onion, scallion, and mint leaves and mix them up nicely. Ooh, I see the skin on there. And aesthetically, it looks beautiful. It has a very unique looking texture yeah. to it. Very thin strips, slightly scaly. It almost looks like uh, suckers from an octopus or a squid. Mm. Mm. Yeah. The skin has such a rubbery, kind of tough texture, like cartilage a bit. But it's not super tough. It's a chew. You can still bite through it. It's like hot dog casing. Like that first when you yeah, break yeah, the yeah. hot dog with your teeth? Yeah. That but every bite. Yeah, which I love. They put so many powerful spices and flavors and seasonings on there that like I couldn't tell you what lizard tastes like by eating this. I think it tastes like pork. But what I like about this is the meat. There's no fat and it's a very nice clean meat. Speaking of clean meat, we have bat right here. Yeah, the cleanest. Little spawns of Satan. <laughs> After torching and chopping the bats, our Kamu cooks mix them with a paste made of chili, galango, lemongrass, garlic, mountain pepper, and MSG. Add some freshness with shallots, scallions, and dill. What do people like about bat? Is it just another source of protein? Do they look at this similar to squirrel or rat or lizard? Next, he jams the mixture into two big bamboo tubes. They believe when they eat the bat, they'll uh, get the energy, get more power for working that's more strong. For working or for romance? I wouldn't work King or romance. Oh. Pork the tubes with banana leaves and leave them to cook over an open fire. Now it should be noted that bats are not completely innocuous. Bats were the host of the SARS virus that eventually spilled over to humans, likely due to wildlife trade or encroachment on wild habitats. It should also be noted that thousands of people have eaten bats throughout history without incident. Since there's no institute of virology nearby this village, I feel confident that we won't be unleashing the next global pandemic from this dinner table. Have you eaten bat before? Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And have you tried bat before? Since he was a child. So no big deal. Oh my gosh, you're still looking at me. And this, this hasn't been cleaned or anything on the inside. I mean, it's just, just is. Oh yeah, like the guts and stuff. Oh, okay, man, I'm struggling a little bit right now. <laughs> What's your approach? I just tell the wing. You don't eat the wing? Yes. Oh, you eat the wings, huh? Mm. Oh, bro, we gotta just take a whole one and eat it. Oh. Okay, let's go. Okay. Ah. Oh. Oh, so good.
Yeah, the flavor's not bad. The skull, real crunchy. Yeah, all the bones. A bit bone. bony, it's just like this little leathery skin around all the bones. And the bones crunch, but you don't feel the full force of the crunch because mm -hmm. they're protected by that skin. Meaty, not bitter. I think I might like this more than the bird this morning. I'll take the bird any day over this. <laughs> what do you think? Lamb. You like it too? Yeah. It's exactly what you think a bat would taste like. Kind of. A little bit smoky from them torching the heck out of it, but not bitter, savory. Just a bit unusual, because you're realizing this thing smelled like insane fecal matter yesterday. Eye-watering, brutal. And then it pooped in your mouth. But it's okay, I kept spitting for 30 minutes. <laughs> I've gotten over a lot of things. Mm -hmm. The raw blood for me, not a big deal. But this is a mentally a bit difficult. It is, because there's just a lot of negative connotation with bats, even from the way that it's portrayed as a creature, you know? But I think that one of the great lessons that I've learned being here just in the last few days is that the resourcefulness of people. Regardless of what's out there, regardless of what kind of creature it is out there, when you're hungry enough and you need for the land to provide for you, there's a resourcefulness to gather, to harvest, and to provide for your family. That's what I think is beautiful about being in these villages. I don't come to these places and feel bad for people. Mm -hmm. I come here and I see things that are missing in my own country. Mm -hmm. I see a strong sense of community, families that are together, people more connected with nature, people more connected with their food, oftentimes mm -hmm. given that they have enough food, people getting exercise every day, and definitely not people talking about depression, anxiety, feeling alone, none of that. If you could add one thing to your life right now that would make you be a little bit happier, what would you add? In terms of he is the head of the village, he wish that government can help connect this to the electricity here. Now very inconvenient because of no electricity. Yeah. Right. It's cutting and he will be happy if what he can make more products and get more income and mm -hmm. can develop in his family. I think that's so honorable because like the thing that I hear him saying is for his happiness is not about him but it's about his community yeah for it's community about his family too, yeah. about the people here and so that's such a different answer to most westerner where their mentality is oh i want to make more money for me i want to yeah. my 401k i want all this it's just i want more opportunities for everybody yes to help me means to help everyone here yeah. lift it up everyone happy community happy family happy he's very happy that's amazing yeah, yeah. Among this country's population, the Lao Lao, literally meaning lowland Lao, are the inhabitants of the river valleys and lowlands along the Mekong River. They make up 68% of this country. This here is a Lao Lao village. They're not connected to the electrical grid, they have little contact with the modern world, and for the most part, People live here as they did generations ago, sourcing most of their food from the river and land. These kids behind us are like swimming through the water trying to dart fish with their little harpoon guns. Next, Dia and I are here to see what it's like to live off the land. Oh, oh, darn! Even if it kills us. Oh, it's biting me! Ah, it's in the eye! From dangerous creature collection. I'm afraid that it's gonna fall in my mouth. To dining on critters that try to bite back. Bring out the live crab. And he throws it. <laughs> right now we're just on the edge of a Laolum village. Oh. Dude, we're gonna be making an ant egg omelet. Okay, I know the word omelet, I know the word eggs, but the ant is still kind of freaking me out. Right, so look up. Oh, oh, darn! Let me introduce you to Yia's early morning antagonist. These are weaver ants, a species that call Southeast Asia home. So here's what's really fun. I'm gonna need you to uh, collect the ant eggs. These ants are master builders with the super ability to construct intricate nests using leaves stitched together with silk produced by their larvae. Do they bite? 100% they bite. Uh, why am I doing this, dude? Um, To reconnect with your uh, motherland? There was a reason why you left the motherland, too. <laughs> <laughs> This man is Fang Kang Kong, the village's premier hunter. He's brought Yia, his mighty ant-gathering weapon of choice, a basket on the end of a stick. You've got your tool. Take it away. So, up. Okay. I got it. All right. Okay, so good. He's elevating the bucket up to where the nest is. Now shake the basket to dislodge the eggs from their nest. Oh my god! Oh god, the eggs are spilling everywhere. This seems to be a straightforward task. Tap, tap away. However, the act of shaking dislodges more than just the eggs. Oh, it's biting me! Ah! It's in the eye! Oh my god! Oh no, man. Ah! 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 The night thing. Oh my gosh, dude. Keep it up, keep it up. The quicker you go, the faster you're done. Oh man, dude, this is kind of like invasive. Oh, there's one in the eye, in the eye. Oh. 
Oh, he's brought the nest down. Do you think there's enough in there for breakfast? Definitely. Cool, let's take a look. What? That's almost nothing. <laughs> That's it's good. I mean, this is a flavoring, right? I was expecting the thing to just be <laughs> overflowing. Like <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey. Oh, why are you bouncing around? I think this is a good start. Let him get a few more, and then we'll tally the total amount of eggs we got at the end. As fierce as these ants are, they've been profoundly helpful to the humans who pester them over the centuries. They've been used in citrus farming to stave away harmful insects. They've been used as a medical treatment against arthritis. Most excitingly, they can be turned into a multitude of dishes, some of which we'll soon experience. Gentlemen, well done. I think this is the toughest harvesting I've ever done. It's painful. And in the end, it's not like you shot a deer. I still feel the ants crawling all over me right now. Yeah, the heebie-jeebies. Now, some people do eat the ants. They're amazing. They taste sour. There's something I always say between like a lime and a green apple. I wonder if maybe we could just squeeze some ants. I did it. Oh yeah, it's like a citrus burst. Isn't that cool? The eggs are different though. The eggs are soon gonna go into a couple different dishes. I've never eaten them raw like this, okay. and evidently you can. Do you wanna eat these with us? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Not bad. The eggs, they pop slightly. You can feel the skin mm -hmm. on them as you chew them, but not a strong flavor. Good way to start the yeah. day, huh? Not bad. I mean, what would you rather have? A Red Bull or just like 20 ant bites? I would still take a Red Bull. To prepare these eggs for cooking, Mr. Fang delicately sifts the ant egg mixture with cassava flour to remove the ants. Once the perfect ratio has been achieved, cooking can begin. Chicken eggs are beaten with salt and that magical monosodium glutamate, also known as MSG. For fresh herbal notes, coriander and spring onion. Now the chicken eggs welcome the ant eggs. Let the egg sizzle and pop. And that is how you shovel down a 1,000 egg omelet. How do you deal with the pain? He just have uh, some more patience that, okay, ignore it and said, yeah, so that's fine. I think after a while, when I got bit, you came to a point where you're just like, whatever. Let's rewind to that point. <laughs> Oh, my crotch. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can see the ant eggs in there. Good large quantity. Oh, this looks good, though. All right, let's yeah. see. Here. Mm hmm. Tastes like fried egg. Very oily. I feel some of the skins from those ant eggs, but I can't say that they have any type of a distinctive flavor that's been released by the heat. For you, do the eggs have any flavor? Kind of like creamy. creamy, and that's what he like about it. It's nice, that citrus in there. I really notice in a lot of cultures all around the world that the egg is used as a canvas that they add flavor into. Yeah, and just mix it with whatever comes from the environment. Our other dish right here is the soup. In a pot of water, add salt, MSG, crushed lemongrass, and ginger. Once the water is boiling, add locally plucked greens and green chilies. Now enrich the soup with loads of ant eggs. Add a touch of flavor with coriander and spring onion, then let the soup simmer. Whoa, this looks wild. It looks like little maggots. Creamy maggots. Tons of spices. So this is a load of warm, sweaty greens. Mm. Mm. The broth is super fresh. No real powerful flavors. It's all just kind of fresh and herbaceous tasting. Every couple bites, you chomp through some of these ant egg balloons and they pop out some creamy goodness. I get the flavors of the ginger, the lemongrass. But it's just so gentle compared to the food we've been having. I mean, we just had bad season with like garlic, chilies, lemongrass. This is just nice and gentle, subtle. That comes subtle. So he said it's yummy because it has some natural sweetness in there. I thought I was going to be more grossed out by the eggs. I like it. It doesn't really taste me that it's there. If you didn't tell me that that was and eggs, you look at it and go, oh, there's little soft rice kernels in there. Mm -hmm. One of the things that really influences the food available in Laos is the fact that this is a landlocked country. In fact, it's the only landlocked country in all of Southeast Asia. I'm curious, have you ever seen the ocean? No. Is that something you would ever hope to do? Yeah, he's very curious. Though it's completely separated from the sea, Laos is intricately tied to the Mekong River that flows through its core, serving as a vital lifeline. How much of the food that you eat are you going out and getting yourself? He has the different kinds of veggie, which is he going to the mountains and then correct them, like this kind of veggie as well. 
the river nourishes the land, ensuring fertile grounds for agriculture and a bounty of wildlife within. Nearby they have a river and that is full of different sea creatures and different plants that they can get. Today, I think we're really focused on the way you're able to live off the land and we want to do our best. I mean, he helped with the ant eggs already. Yeah. Maybe I could help uh, collect, hunt, or gather something as well. I heard that there's a food we're going to be trying later today. When we eat it, it's still going to be alive, but first we have to catch it. Okay, let's do this. In this village, the tradition of producing food from the river runs deep through generations. From a young age, children join their parents by the river to watch and learn how it's done. Yi and I have both been tasked with collecting some freshwater protein for an upcoming meal. Check it out, Sonny and the girl squad, yes? Yes. We are upriver from Sunny right now. He's split us off and we're on the banks of this river and we're gonna be catching rice crabs. Now it's these little black crabs that's kind of burrow themselves on the side of this river here in the mud. I'm catching this right here. I know what you're asking. What the heck is that? Well, inside of here, there are little baby shrimpies. The process for this began already 10 days ago. They put all these stakes in the ground. Inside, they put some rocks, leaves, branches, and then they put in buffalo bones. Oh man, shrimp love buffalo bones. It's their native food. Buffalo bones. Now my concern is this. I've been told that we have to be careful with leeches and maybe even snakes. The idea is that over 10 days, shrimp will come here, see the bones, lay eggs, and then they'll develop a big population, like a small to medium sized city. What they don't know is that we're about to wreak havoc on their city. I'm really nervous, but yesterday with the ants, he really helped me out, so. Should we see what happens? Let's do this. So he's going under the mud here. Then you can get it right on the bottom, scrape the bottom with that basket. For this, you have to have a really keen eye because the crab itself looks like all the debris. So it's like sifting for gold in here. The net is all the way down on the ground. I'm moving this way. She's telling me I need to get the net really low and the rocks and sticks have to be taken out. If the shrimp leave, if they get swept away, they're gonna go right into the net. He's going way into the roots, right into the ground here, because these crabs burrow themselves in real deep in there. So it's just not an easy, just scrape it along the banks, but you gotta go to the messiest, dirtiest, toughest spot. We are working hard, and I'm wondering if Sonny's doing really well and working hard in his section of the river. Oh man, what if we do this and there's no shrimp inside? I don't know the language they speak, but I know a lack of confidence when I hear it. I think they're saying, oh my God, there's no shrimp in here. Oh, is that shrimp? No, it's a fish. Oh, oh, what he's doing here is he's just breaking away this bank and he's getting deep inside there. Let's see if I can do this. This is no small task. Is this a shrimp? Oh. There's a shrimp. All right, look at this little river prawn right here. That's bigger than I thought it would be. Oh, I see movement. Oh, it's a little guy. Yeah. Oh my gosh. All this hard work bent over just for this meal, huh? Oh, 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 oh. Dude, calm down. Just in this little thicket of leaves and dirt, there is so much light. What's tough is it'd be easy to chuck something like this out and then you realize, oh wait, there's a little shrimp in there. Oh, I see another one. Oh, here we go. That's a couple of shrimp. Our guide here. Oh, there's a little shrimp. He's got another crab. He's so calm about it, you know? Well, check it out. So here, at the end of the day, you can see we have some little fish, we have shrimp, we have crabs all together in that trap. This is really ingenious. I've never seen anything like it. From here, I'm hoping you got some food too. Next, we're gonna be eating some of what's in here. With the crabs caught by Yia, we'll soon be treated to a death-defying meal, likely to give us shell shock. Um, this is too dangerous. But first, an equally spine-chilling appetizer featuring live shrimp. Is it vital that the shrimp be alive? When it's alive, it's more fun. When you put in the mouth, and then it's more like alive in your mouth as well. I thought she was gonna say fresh. She said it's more fun. Let's get to this recipe. Ma'am, take it away. So the shrimp have been washed already, and she's gonna dump them into the bowl here. First, we're gonna hit it with some lemongrass, then we have red chilies, there's green chilies, cilantro and uh, green onions right in there. Then we got some toasted rice flour here. Toasted rice flour, you know, in Lao cooking is very common. 
This right here is MSG, and then salt. There we go. And she's about to squeeze some citrus on here with these limes. I love the way she's cutting the limes like that, because I'm going to start doing that in my kitchen. <laughs> and then you have the badak. It's a fermented fish sauce, the real, real stuff. Now giving it a little bit of a mix, getting all that salt and all those delicious ingredients bound together. The smell is incredible. Mmm. Mmm. I killed mine with my teeth, like when I was in prison. Oh, yeah, you were in prison? Yeah, they had shrimp there. You went to a nice prison. Oh, there's some sharp bits, some soft, juicy bits. The thing is, I've had raw shrimp many times. It's delicious. And so the fact that it's raw isn't that strange. I guess it's more the fact that it's alive and it has like its antenna and legs and that horn shooting out from between its eyes. Texturally, those little crunchy bits, I like it. The flavors are great. I think that this taste is very natural. Do you like it? You seem like you don't like it. I'll have some No, I can, man. Give it to me. <laughs> Something going on here. This whole village is surrounded by two different rivers, and it seems like it brings so much life here. How important is the river to them for sourcing their food? Some kind of some lap and it's important because they can live without money. So mm -hmm. that the way that they can go into the river, they can collect some food there, and they don't need to go to the market. There's just nothing really comparable in the U.S. If you're, unless you're talking about actual hunting. In America, doing this stuff is a sport. This is their survival, and it really connects them to the food, right? And think how much of that limits waste. Really incredible. This is a snack, a little bit of an appetizer for what's coming next, because the animal that you caught the crab, yeah. soon we're gonna be eating it live. Preparations are underway for our final meal. If there's anything I've learned today, it's that this river has so much inside of it that you can actually eat, whether it's an animal or this. This is algae. Oh, it feels so weird. It is way more slimy than I thought. Take a look at that. So this has just been collected from the river. Villagers here harvest algae using crab nets, which collects into green slimy clumps throughout the river. They bring it here, they rinse it out a little bit, and soon that is gonna be food. It looks like mermaid hair that's been rotting for a few days. It is unbelievably slimy. It has a unique texture. I'm told you could just eat it raw like this. You know, just because you can eat something doesn't mean you have to all the time. You just make a mental note, oh, I could eat that, and then move on with your day. All right, that's fascinating. So it kind of feels like hair in your mouth when you're eating it, and not a lot of flavor, but very slimy. She's gonna do some stuff to this to make it taste much more tasty. I can tell you that. Meanwhile, Mr. Fang is preparing fish from the very same life-giving river. These tilapia are cleaned, gutted, then skewered. In lieu of playing video games, these kids blend play with practicality, spearing fish that will feed the village. Oh, Not only can you get shrimp, but these kids behind us are like swimming through the water trying to dart fish with their little harpoon guns. They're like little Navy SEALs. They go under and then boom, they pop up and there's a fish on there. It's incredible. The fish will roast slowly over fiery cinders until they cook all the way through. I'm really amazed at the technique of grilling this fish. This is something that's so fun because it's so primal. I am feeling it. Oh, it's really hot, right? <laughs> Sometimes in the US, you just hear cooks complain about their grill and their fire saying, oh, you know, it doesn't work or, oh, the technology is not where we want it to be. But I'm sitting here where this is the technology, fire on the grill and then meat on a stick over it. I gotta say, this is quite the meal. Take a look. Of course, we have the fish caught fresh from the river. We have this, this is algae. Then we have a salad here. We'll talk about that soon. I think we should start with the fish here, huh? Oh, you just peel it back, it flakes off. This fish here reminds me of some lake fish, like some crappy, sunny. All right, let's try it out. Mm hmm Very nice. A delicate, flaky, white meat. Mm -hmm. It's a subtle fish flavor. And the skin tastes so good. It's like real fatty and smoky. It's simple, but delicious. What I really like about having that skin on the fish when while he was grilling it, that skin actually protects the fish meat so it doesn't dry out. This fish has a lot of little bones in it, so yeah. <laughs> oh, it was stuck in my retainer. Next, we have this right here, the algae. Though this food source is known to be incredibly nutritious, I should mention again that it's very slimy. So here's how you get the most out of your algae harvest. Prepare a flavorful seasoning by combining chili, garlic, onion, salt, and MSG, then grinding them into a harmonious blend. Cut the algae into a hot pan, then cook it until it reaches the desired gushiness. 
One's gushy, toss it in with the seasonings. Ground sesame seeds, fish sauce, coriander, spring onion, and local eggplant. Mix thoroughly and serve. Now, I don't know if you slurp it. I don't know if you... I guess you maybe you can scoop it. It is gloopy. Oh, bro, I don't know how I can do that, man. Mm. <laughs> it's still really slimy. It is full of spices. They've given life to it, but the texture is largely the same, or maybe they made it even more goopy, I think. Texture-wise, it's like somebody already chewed spinach, and you're now eating their spinach that they already chewed. Mama Bird just gave me a bite of some greens. Then <laughs> you chew it, then it seems like there's some sand in there. I do feel that grittiness. It's interesting. The taste is nice. It does have a little bit of a spinach taste to it. Think about the nutritional value of it. It's that power green, you Super know? Superfood. With you able to go out and retrieve so much food from the area around you. What percentage of the food you're eating would you say comes from the land and what percent comes from the market? Okay. Like what, no? 80% that's from nature. If it's not necessary, he's not gonna buy from the market. Well, there is one food you can't get from the market. <laughs> Garlic, toasted chili, MSG, salt, sugar, fermented fish sauce, vine, cherry tomato, and eggplant are combined into a tantalizing blend. Once mixed, the shredded papaya joins to absorb the flavors. As for the crabs, they're served as is, alive and ready to attack as ever. The fruits of your labor today, Yia Vang. Oh, I thought we were gonna cook these. Yeah, they look a bit underdone, huh? Here's how it works. First of all, there's a papaya salad here. That is the base. And then I'm told you somehow combine a live crab with the salad with your mouth. <laughs> He's got a nice sized crab. He breaks off the biters, the claws. Then the tip of each leg is ripped off. Things still moving, dude. That's awesome. I'm so ready to get revenge on these guys. So then he grabs some papaya and he throws it. Oh! <laughs> dude, I'm down. Let's roll. Let's go, you little mother. Mom told me never play with your food, but I'm down to this. Ready? Oh, that's delicious. Is it tough? No, it's like eating a crunch and shit. Are you being serious right now? Oh, that is, look yeah. at this. This is no joke, man. Look at those claws. Oh gosh, yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a big claw. Sorry. I'm gonna hit it with some papaya. Oh. Sounds like a good potato chip. Mm. Kill bite. It's a little like fingernails. There's a little bit of a swampy taste mm -hmm. to it. Like if you're doing an oyster. That's what I thought. I agree with that. Cool. Well, I guess end of the episode. That was awesome. No, I want to eat a small one. I want to eat the pinchers. Have you ever eaten it with the claws on? All right, that's what I'm doing. I want the full experience. I am still taking off the toenails though. Get a little papaya on there. Pinchers and everything. Yeah, here we go. Here we go, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Look how it's the side of your mouth. <laughs> Sorry. They try to run after the first bite. I, I, I saw them moving in your mouth. <laughs> it's really crunchy. The papaya salad, meanwhile, is delicious. Very tasty. This has got to be one of the most unique village foods I've ever seen in my life. It's adventurous. It has like a hint of danger. The taste isn't bad. I would say I like the medium to smaller ones more. It's a little bit more balanced flavor. The big ones pack a big seafoody, rivery punch. We've seen so many different new foods here today, and I'm really blown away by how much of the natural gifts of the land here they're able to utilize. For you, growing up with all these stories of Laos, and then coming here and seeing some of this in person, what impact does this have on you? So the last few days of being here in Laos, especially in Northern Laos, has been so eye-opening for me. I've always heard these stories about how my mom and dad, they used the land, how the land fed them, and literally, I've been experiencing that. And now I've truly seen it, and I truly understand that ecosystem where we come from, you could be in Minnesota, you could be in New York, you could be in Arizona, and your diet could be 100% exactly the same. It wouldn't be dependent at all on your geography. That's what's so interesting is just seeing somebody whose life is so married to the land. I think that that's what's amazing about the people of Laos, is that if you did take them and put them in a different region, they will figure it out. Yeah. Just that tenacity, regardless of where they are, they will figure out how to use that land. And you know, even to understand that you can do that with algae. Somebody had to try it or even to say, hey, to do this with these crabs and to eat it this way. Somebody had to do that, but eventually people figure out and that's what I love about this land.
Today is a special day because for the first time, Hmong American chef Yia Vang is connecting with other Hmong people in the country his parents once called home. But wait, there's more to this story. Though they make up only 9% of the Laotian population, the Hmong influence on culture, traditions, and food is profound. These greens grow plentifully on the mountains. They are everywhere, and it's the best way to stretch this meal out. Brace yourself, because the menu here transcends the ordinary. Take a look at this. I don't know if that's done all the way through. Oh, it's medium rare. It's okay, bro. Is it okay, bro? Yeah, sure. We're diving mouth first into this wild culinary landscape, taking on Hmong recipes that are both delicious oh. and daring. Are the bones in here as well? There's some bones in there, but it's all, you know, broken down. From pork parts cooked to perfection. I've been hearing about this way of grilling. There's so much little nuances in this. To giant rodents big enough to eat your rat terrier. These things can get up to this big. What the heck? That's a beaver. Chef, we have finally made it to Among Village. Yes. This is awesome. How does it feel? Residing among the mountains, a familiar terrain to most Laotian Hmong, you'll find Ban Lang Lao Village. Feels great. All the housing, everything, it's exactly what my mom and dad described to me when I was a kid. As we arrive, Hmong villagers are already busied with preparations for today's upcoming feast. Cooking pots set up, vegetables chopped, and rice cooked. From men to women, from the little ones to the elders, all are involved in this culinary endeavor, treating each other, Yia and myself, to the finest of Hmong cooking. To add to the feast, I've brought a little gift. We've had it shipped in from Luang Prabang. It's behind me right now. This is a domesticated, once wild boar. They do raise some pigs. They don't get this big. And they do try to snare pigs from the wild once in a while. But of course, those would be much thinner. This is not a thin pig. It's a city pig. You know, it's got that good life. Right. <laughs> in order to complete the task at hand, without incident, the village has recruited six men, each with their own role. They go to great lengths to collect the blood, whose precious calories will be allocated to another meal. And in this process, they believe that you have to get all that blood out before the animal completely dies because you don't want the meat to be tainted or ruined. If the blood isn't all out, they feel there's a belief that dead blood inside uh, will taint the meat. After blood collection, the villagers pour hot water over its body to ease hair removal. But to finish the job, They'll use fire. Now, my mom and dad, we do this in the States, but they just take a big old torch right to it. With this, they take a bunch of these bamboos and they made these twigs with these bamboos and they just put the fire right on. And while they're doing that, another team will come by right after and scrape all that access, all those little pieces of hair in there. I've never seen anything like this. It's absolutely genius. This is like a technique I want to use back at home. The boar is continuously charred and scraped until its skin, which will also be consumed, is smooth and clean. The organs are collected to make a Hmong dish we'll soon taste. Breaking the animal down will take time. Ye and I head to the jungle in search of less common protein options. Hmong villagers living in highland regions rely on hunting animals like wild boar and deer, or trapping small animals like birds, bamboo rats, or squirrels. And no one knows how to trap squirrels better than Mr. Tao. A squirrel might come down this tree, absolutely, cross a branch, and go up this tree. You know Mom. Yeah. That's exactly what he said. It's a snare. Oh. You also have to be really strategic about having this guy right here, too. Right, so he's already posted this stick into the ground to act as a snare. That's going to create tension. So then you take out your wire cutters. Yep, that you harvested from the jungle. <laughs> right. This triangular steel structure, he binds it to the stick using a steel wire. That uh, steel triangle has a string on it. That he is tying to the stick right here. Uh, this is like the set part. Oh, dude. Okay, I totally get what's happening here. Yeah. Oh, this is awesome. That's how it works. And so usually when you find the squirrel, is it alive still or is it dead? Oh, it hangs around the neck and it's dead. <laughs> Do you think your father ever had to do something like this? Oh yeah, I've heard stories of it. Your father had to leave Laos and go to Thailand. Yeah, it was a long journey. He said we would walk for days and there were no roads. I can't even imagine 
traveling through here. There's no trails here, you know? At the age of 12, during the time of the Vietnam War, Yi's father was recruited to work alongside American troops in a 1961 to 1975 anti-communist CIA operation known Laos. as the Secret War. America's not-so-secret war in Asia. There are no American combat forces in Laos. When the Communist Party, Patet Lao, emerged triumphant, thousands of Hmong villagers were targeted and left with no choice but to flee the country they called home. Many traveled by foot for hundreds of miles through thick jungle, like that which surrounds us now. To catch food, did you have to do stuff like this? Absolutely. They would set up traps in rivers for catfish. They would set up traps like this to catch squirrels or a small little lizard. More than that is they would eat the roots of trees. Many who fled did not survive. Yi's father made it to a refugee camp in Thailand. Going from Laos to getting to Thailand, do you know how long that took him? It took them a few months, but then he, he was one of the guys that kept going back to go get more people. Wow. So we're able to set a trail that was like the safe trail, so he would go back to help other refugees who wanted to escape Laos. That's uh, remarkable. These days, some Hmong villagers still carry on the same as they did generations ago, hunting, harvesting, and trapping whatever they can find in these mountains. <laughs> The squirrel will be cooked two ways, but first, they must be singed over an open fire, rinsed with clean water, then sliced to remove the organs. Our first dish includes squirrel meat and squirrel bones, minced together by hand. All of this, including the bones, will soon become edible. Next, add lemongrass, spring onion, fresh chilies, pounded sticky rice powder, and coriander. Then, mix everything together. Wrap the mixture in banana leaves and secure it before steaming. Did you help cook these? Uh, yeah. Okay, is this the best one? <laughs> best one. Okay, thank you. Hosting us, Miss Sai Yang and her husband, Mr. Fei Long Li, both born and raised in this village. She said, welcome to the village. He's very happy and thankful to be hosting us here. Oh, same. This is quite a treat. I think very communal eating, right? We don't have any plates in front of us. Everyone gets a spoon and then you kind of just dig in. What about that? There's this a bowl is, of water. It's lukewarm and it helps kind of lubricate everything down. Oh, so we all share that water. We share the water too, yeah. Yeah. Oh. It's like a mint. There's some bones in there, but it's all broken down. This reminds me of when I ate with the Long Neck Karen people in Northern oh. Thailand. They cook chicken, they chop every bone and put that in there as well. So you were eating bones, tendon, meat, fat, skin, everything. Well, absolutely. Think about it. Like all that flavor in that bone when it's cooked together. I mean, you're getting that true flavor of that squirrel. Yeah, and a lot of texture too. All right, let's try it out. Yep, you gotta work your way around the bowl. Texture. Mm -hmm. Something I really like about food is chewing it, because there's something satisfying about chewing all the way through it. You have to gently push your teeth down so you don't accidentally break your fillings. It's not a dish that you hurry up and eat. Mm. It actually slows you down. If you think about it, philosophically, monk food actually slows everything down, you know, because you're gonna have to really work it. Between all the bones, I can just suck out the flavor. Yeah, right? And that full depth of that squirrel, I mean, it tastes like northern Wisconsin squirrel to me, you know? <laughs> it does. I've never had squirrel in the USA. Oh, really? Yeah, don't do city squirrels, dude. They eat diapers and they taste like diapers. <laughs> As you go, you get a little water here. Do I just pick up the bowl? No, use your spoon, dude. Oh, jeez. Don't be that guy. <laughs> See? There you go. This is either great water or the worst soup ever. This broth is a little bland. It helps neutralize everything. I see. Our second squirrel breakfast has a new and unique ingredient combination I've never seen before. First, the meat is grilled over an open fire. In a pot, they boil lemongrass, then the meat, then toasted onion, toasted chilies, toasted spicy wood, and toasted sticky rice. Add eggplant, banana flour, and some local herbs found in the jungle. The result? A tantalizing squirrel stew. I got a whole leg right here. Oh, it's smoky. You can still smell when they singe the hair yep. off. Fatty. The meat overall is tender, it's sweet, it is like dark meat. Really delicious, deep flavor. Wow. That's good. I mean, and I think that all trip here, we've been talking about that bitter taste. You can feel a little bit of that and it gives it a little depth. What if I wanted to put some rice and some broth? Can I do that? Absolutely. Yes. That's like my childhood growing up here, right there. Mm -hmm. He's very grateful that you love this and it's delicious to you. He's saying, as Hmong people, sometimes we just know what we know out here. Mm. And even if some people think it's not good or it's good, it's good to us. And he's very excited that this is delicious to you. I want to ask you a little bit more about the village here. About how many families are in this village? 47 family units. The land where your house is, do you own that? How does that work? Oh, okay. Officially, it belongs to Laos. But 
they are the caretaker. So everybody who lives on the mountain, it's part of what you do. It's part of yours. Yeah. But officially, they can't sell it to a mining company or something. Absolutely. Right. But if a mining company decides to come in, they're kind of crap out of luck. Exactly. And that's kind of the poopy part of this. That is very poopy. What do most of the people here do for money? They harvest the rubber trees and then livestock. What is the biggest challenge just day to day for people here? Just because the terrain's so rough and there's no vehicles, you just have to walk up and down and it's tiresome. What about for you? It's the everyday carrying of water. It has to be timed out. Where does the water come from? They have a spring, but we're able to pipe it through this area right down here. Mm -hmm. And so everybody in the village, they all come here. And that's a little easier, but still it's difficult. So imagine living on the other side and you have to wait your turn to come in and get the water. As preparations for our village feast continue, the men break down the meat for a multitude of dishes. Every part of the animal will be used. The meat, fat, skin, and bones too. Some protein portions will be allocated for barbecue, while the fat is reserved for a special soup. Before we sink our teeth in, Yia must undergo a countryside Hmong initiation. Our squirrel feast is complete, and now we're moving on to our next rodent, the bamboo rat. Bamboo? I love bamboo. I eat yeah. bamboo all the time. Rat? Never had anything called a rat before. Yeah, they eat bamboo too. Yeah, yeah. You already have so much in common. Yeah. <laughs> These bucktooth, stout, beady-eyed furballs are known to burrow underground near bamboo trees. This is a, a bit more modern trap. It has a door. Oh, we don't even know you can leave right now. They go in for the bait. As soon as they grab it, what? What holds it is those little springs. It's a very basic trap. What's remarkable is these guys are actually pretty young. If it was a typical like rice field rat, you'd be like, oh, good size. No, these things can get up to this big. What the heck? That's a beaver. Look oh. at those teeth. Oh. Looks like my grandpa's teeth. Oh, he smoked so many that. cigarettes. In a place like this, they're also a treasured delicacy. After slaughtering, the bamboo rats are singed to remove their fur. Once it's cleaned from the inside, it's seasoned with MSG, salt, garlic, pepper, chili, coriander, and lemongrass. Grill over indirect heat until it smells like fully cooked rat meat. So we have right here the bamboo rat. It looks a lot different from when we saw it earlier. They look like a singing trio. Look at them. Oh, hi, guys. La, 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 la. This is the great one. La, la. So there's some little ones and there's the big one that's been quartered. Even the quarters are bigger than those little ones. Take a look at this. I don't know if that's done all the way through. Oh, uh, medium rare. It's okay, bro. Is it okay, bro? Yeah, sure. I'm gonna build up to that big one. Yeah. It looks fantastic. It also looks like it's medium rare. This one looks like it's cooked all the way through. Immediately, I can see there are some organs left over. Mm. Oh, it's great. It is pretty good. I just taste like a liver. You can tell they've coated it in delicious seasonings. Yep. I'm gonna do a little bamboo rat belly. Yeah, let's go for it. Go. That's actually really nice. Rats have a certain sweetness to them. Mm, I'm gonna remember that when I see one of those New York rats. I'm like, oh, you probably have a certain sweetness to you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't say enough about the smokiness of this thing, you know? Mm -hmm. That's delicious. Mm -hmm. Great seasonings, mm -hmm. crisp skin, juicy, sweet, dark meat. Again, I think the word rat is what like deterred me. Mm. And also, here's the thing. You are what you eat, right? So if this thing just eats bamboo all the time, of course you'll get that kind of that sweetness from the bamboo. Oh, you know? I see. If that's the case, what would you taste like? Broken dreams, regret. Mm. <laughs> Earlier in the forest, you were talking about your father and his story, but your mom and dad both met in Thailand at a refugee camp. So she had her own journey out of Laos. Yeah, she had to escape Laos with her family. She had a husband, three kids, and she was still pretty young. And what happened was in that escape, her husband was killed. They were all captured and put into an internment camp and they were there for almost a year. In Laos? In Laos, yep. And then secretly there were other Hmong men that came to that camp and helped them escape that camp. She said that they were so hungry that at one point all they were doing was digging for roots from trees and they were eating that and they had to be in complete silence and complete darkness. 29 refugee camps were built by the Thai government. Camp Ban Venai became a temporary home for a large Hmong population. Yia's parents, both ripped from their previous lives, crossed paths here and began a new journey together. As a result, Yia was born in that same refugee camp in 1984. When I see someone like my mom and she tells me things like, hey honey, I know things are tough, but this too shall pass. I know where her perspective is coming from. I didn't realize this until I was older because my mom and dad are both quiet people. They're not the life of the party type. And they're, I tell people, man, like, they're kind of like my North Star, you know? Like, I always feel like they're like this lighthouse and I'm in this ocean and I'm lost and confused and I can look back to that lighthouse. Being up here in these mountains, it's like coming to a home that I've never been to, but I feel like I belong, you know, so.
Right here, we have one of our designated cooking locations. The pot is on here, and inside the pot, a load of pork fat. The soup is made by boiling chunks of boar fat, along with local Hmong mustard greens. These greens grow plentifully on the mountains. They are everywhere, and it's the best way to stretch this meal out. While the soup is simmering, another dish is underway. Boar sausage. It starts with a finely chopped medley of aromatics. Coriander, garlic, chili, and onion are all mixed with the minced meat. Now, a miracle happens. We're gonna be stuffing the sausage right now. What they did was they cut this bamboo as a starter here, and then you just start stuffing. Like shoving toothpaste back in the tube, the meat blend makes its way into this natural intestinal casing, boiled briefly, then put on the grill to finish off. The larger remaining chunks of pork are boiled, rubbed down with salt, stuffed with a bamboo stick, then grilled over fire. What I really like about this is it's low and slow. You see how far it is out from the ember? The meat is portioned out for the attending villagers, each serving prepared with a singular purpose in mind, to create a communal experience. This food looks incredible. Gentlemen, can you tell the difference in taste between the pink pig and the wild boar? Yes, the boar will taste different. The transformation this has undergone, now it just looks like a typical beautiful sausage that you would find at a store, at a restaurant. Mmm. Mm. Oh, man. That, the snap of that intestine, the skin mm. as you bite through it, and then the mince of the meat is such a unique texture. It's all done by hand with knives. Exactly. There's no grinding. Mmm. That's addictive. I love that people just take water with their spoon. Yeah, dude. Why not cups? There's no cups around here, dude. Very loud. He was saying that the elder can't produce as much saliva, so between every bite, you get a bowl of water to help wow. lubricate everything down. But yeah, that's a good point. I gotta lube up. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Here we have the barbecue. It looks gorgeous. It's like a giant thick piece of fat, a little bit of protein, some skin on there. Mm. The taste is so clean. And just to know that this boar was coming up this morning, you know? Mm -hmm. As fresh as it gets. Right here we have some ribs. I should die for. What are the proteins that you're eating most often in this village? Chicken, sometimes special, be like buffalo or beef. Fish? In this village, there's no river. Every time they do get fish, it's from the market only. Earlier today, we were talking about challenges the Hmong people in this village face today, but I want to talk about challenges people have faced over the last couple of generations. For you, when you think about your dad or your grandpa, what kind of challenges have they faced as a Hmong person growing up here in Laos? There's a lot of difficulty, but keeping a positive mindset mindset. He thinks of his grandfather where his generation was just to find a place to settle. Mm. They were constantly moving and every time you move you had to uproot your family, redo your garden or your farm all over again. You couldn't have a home. For his and his generation they had education compared to where his grandfather was. There are so many brighter better things to look forward to. It's a very similar story that echoes from the Hmong people of Vietnam, being pushed into lands unknown, being in new soil, new elevations, new geography, and having to reinvent your way of life. Here, we have what my producer has referred to as fat soup. Yep. But what would you call this in Hmong language? Literally, it's just mustard green with pork. So for the sausage, for the barbecue, we use a lot of the leaner meat. And you can't just throw that fat away. That fat then becomes a part of the stew. And it's so rich. Oh, mmm, dude. It tastes delicious, but much more mild flavors than everything else, right? Yes. Hmong mustard green is like a mix between arugula and spinach. So I've got a big fatty piece right here. Mmm. There's still, there's still hair on there, isn't there? Texture. There's texture. Bro, we ate a full bag. Are you going to complain about that little hair? I'm not complaining. I'm just noticing. That is different, right? It's very rich, but it's broken down a little bit, so it's a bit soft. It's nice, but really, you got to mix it equally with the greens to get that true balance. How's that? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Mm. For you, I know you've had your own difficult history when you were younger as part of the war. Could you talk about your part that took place in the war here in Laos? She started out as an orphan, no parents. Him and his brother, they were working on the tobacco field and the bombings happened. You see all the burns? Oh. That's from the bombing. So he felt like he had nothing to live for because of his disformity from the injury. He was so angry that it didn't matter to him, that he just wanted to join something and didn't matter if he died. 20 years he fought. Wow. After that, he settled, got married. During the war, the Hmong people were divided between two sides. One side fought with the American CIA, while the other fought for communist Laos. Mr. Yachong Tor was among those who fought against the USA. The people you were fighting against back then, do you still hold animosity against them? He said that war is war, and in that time there was two sides, but now times have changed and it's unified as one. He sees it as friends now. We all know from that time period 
there really were no winners. Absolutely, and I don't think that there was no good guy or bad guy. Propaganda. Yes, absolutely. It's interesting, both our parents were affected in some way. Even my father was drafted to join the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. and he wouldn't do it. He went to boot camp. He essentially kind of faked an injury. You know, I wouldn't tell this story if he was alive, but he, he passed recently, and to me, I think he shouldn't be ashamed. Yeah. I think he knew in his heart it wasn't a place where the U.S. should have been in the first place. And it was kind of his moral duty, his moral obligation to do the right thing and to abstain from fighting. And that's what he did. And eventually they shipped him back home and they said, you're useless, get out of here. <laughs> this has been a deeply fascinating educational day. It's been a pleasure to share food with you and sit across from you. So thank you so much. <laughs> we are friends. We'll meet together. We'll be together. Hours from the next big city, deep in the countryside, you'll find a village known as Bantan. Somebody. Somebody. A place very close to where Ye's mother grew up. This part of Laos holds the key to Ye's heritage. Now, in a return to the land his parents intimately knew, Ye will experience a homecoming. Oh. Oh my god. Wow! Draped in Hmong colors with an entire village joining in to create a massive meal that will feed dozens. Right here we have lungs and a freaking trachea. Take a look at this. Including some Hmong food offerings I've never seen before. Oh no. Are those roots or mice? Uh, yes. But before we dive in, he has been tasked with the very labor-intensive first course. Purple, pounded, sticky rice. The Hmong word is called yua, but it's almost like a mochi. This dish begins with sticky rice that's already been steamed, then dumped into a wooden vessel where it'll undergo an intense physical transformation. So what we're doing is we're incorporating all the rice in together. Most people might think that this is a strength thing, but it's actually a technique. And the gentleman behind me is just giving me critique and saying, you're not doing it right. <laughs> so we're gonna start pounding it. It's one at a time. Yeah. So I'm like out of breath here. Man, with the mixer, you gotta just turn it on. This, oh my gosh, is a great cardio workout. Oh, the old guy is bolsing. Oh, he lives in America. He must rest too much. He can't keep up. Yep. After Yia has finished sprinkling his sweat and tears into our dinner, the sticky rice can be portioned by the village women. To prevent this purple mass from sticking, they cleverly apply boiled egg yolks to their fingers. Wrap the content using galangal leaf. The pounded rice can be eaten like this, or you can add another flavored dimension tossing it over fire and toasting the outside. There's no ah, uh, it's just nyajong. Would you, I heard an ah. Uh. Well, that's more Hmong, just say nyajong. But I want to be Hmong now. Nah, uh, just say nyajong. It's my second day being... Say nyajong. 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 Mm. We're accompanied by the village chief, Zhongja, and his wife, Yao Ya. I'm so happy and excited to be here. This is our final video, and we've taken such a, a long journey to reach this village, and it's absolutely worth it. How do you feel? I feel great coming in, watching them make this, and being part of making it. Dude, that's just like, oh man, we make this at home. But just a few more different technical stuff. So what's fascinating to me is a couple years ago, I was in Vietnam in the Northwest, and I met some Hmong folks there, and they made the same dish in almost exactly the same way. Yep. It was the purple rice, it was the big hammers, it was the egg yolk on the hands yep. to make sure that the Hmong mochi doesn't stick to your hands, all of that. But when you open it up, <laughs> You're good. Cool. <laughs> some parts are a little bit charred, some are still gooey. Yeah. There's a, just a mixture of textures here. Mm. Mm -hmm. For me, like growing up, this was always a treat. Mm -hmm. You know, this is your snack. I don't know what else to compare the soft bits to except for mochi. Mm -hmm. And then we have kind of a dipping sauce yep. here as well. Sugar cane. I think uh, from where we come from, maple syrup, but with sugar cane. Oh, can I tell you? <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't have that last time. I had like a spicy dipping oh, sauce last okay. time. That's good though, right? Oh, that steps it up. I feel like my dopamine centers just blew up. You are the chief of the village, is that correct? Yeah, man. Now, is that an elected position? How does one become a chief? Yeah. They kind of have a little election, no vote, village consensus. And what are the responsibilities of the chief? Basically, it's taking care of the welfare of the village, making sure that there's equality, if there's any problem or anything in the village, you know, he helps with the decision making. This was an amazing meal. Tomorrow we have a big event, an event in your honor. We could call it a homecoming of sorts. <laughs> are you the king or the queen if we're doing homecoming? Oh, yeah, not that kind of homecoming. Oh. 
early tomorrow morning, an entire buffalo will be sacrificed and used to make a long list of Hmong dishes. Yia's mother's cousin is joining the feast, and Yia has no idea she's coming. Are you serious? Yeah. Today, the village chief's house will become the epicenter for this homecoming event. All right, good morning, my man. Morning, dude. An important ceremony will and must be conducted inside their house before the cooking process can begin. Uh, but first, an early morning welcome uh, drink. Oh, this is my kind of introduction. Booze, and it definitely does not taste important. I just want to know that it's 8, 19 a.m. Absolutely. Yeah. These are my kind of people. Oh, yeah, that's... <laughs> One hell of a way to start the day. Oh, it is. Oh, you get two of them. Holy cow. Here we go. I'm going to take a nap after this. Mm -hmm. An altar is piled with specimens of varying value and meaning, including two live chickens. This ceremony pays homage to the buffalo sacrifice while simultaneously bestowing blessings upon the homeowner. He's gonna drink this now to call the spirits. The Hmong religion for many embraces animism and the village shaman is the healing practitioner serving as a guide between the spirit world and the real one we're sitting in right now. I mean, it makes me wanna be a shaman. He starts out with a double shot of beer. Sponsored by Beer Law. <laughs> <laughs> buffalo horn tips are thrown to the ground to determine which way the soul has gone. When the souls are believed to have entered the house, drinks are shared among the participants as a sign of welcoming. Bro, warm beer, bro. Oh. Offerings are presented to the house owners, symbolizing the unity of their souls and bodies as one entity. I'm saying thank you for honoring us, thank you for blessing us. As a result, two chickens are chosen for sacrifice. Their souls serve as a blessing, supporting the bond between the hosts and the spiritual realm. With today's first ceremony complete, it's time for the buffalo sacrifice. The buffalo holds a prominent place in Hmong culture, often portrayed in Hmong art and textiles. They're crucial for farming and plowing fields, so the slaughter of an animal such as this only happens on special occasions. Um. That's a first for me. Oh, really? They just sever the spine immediately yeah. with an axe. Yep. My question is, is it just different depending on the village you go, you think? Yeah, definitely. Geographical isolation has led to diverse practices among the several Hmong subgroups. Regardless, one fact remains that binds all Hmong together. The art of resourcefulness and letting nothing go to waste. The blood, the hooves, the organs, the skin. Everything but its last breath. <laughs> This guy's getting everyone drunk. <laughs> While everyone is getting their hands dirty, other villagers play a more supportive role. So this is his way of saying cheers, and he's going to drink to everyone working together. Cheers. Oh, it's allowed to pour a drink for yourself? Because everyone's working, and they can't drink. So he's going to you know, pour it for himself. Bottoms up, buddy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's real strong. Oh, thank you. Is this some beef? It's still moving. Now, I'm all for surprise shots, but this... This is not what I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, Stay tartar, yeah. buddy. Yeah. It's still warm, bro. <laughs> it's still warm. Shaman says great, great, great. Very good. <laughs> I've never had meat that fresh. It was still pulsating in my hand. That's wild. How's oh, the meat taste? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Feast preparations are in full swing, with different parts of the buffalo being delivered to kitchens scattered across the village. Each fire team takes responsibility for cooking one specific dish. Eager hands meticulously break down the animal even further, depending on the dish it's destined for. But during this culinary choreography, one particular part of the buffalo I get to cook with the villagers today takes a different path. This thing super fresh. It was just beating literally like an hour ago. Is this guy doing a cooking show in my show? What is this, Food Network? We should go right into the heart, carve this bad boy out. Probably not gonna use this whole thing. Chef Yia's culinary training started as a child, observing and tasting the traditional Hmong recipes his parents whipped together at home while living in the USA. You know what the one thing about cooking fresh meat is? It's still warm, you know? <laughs> now, even as a restaurant tour, Tenderize it. Yia may be facing his most challenging audience yet. One man from this village who has known nothing but Hmong food from the time he was born. Next thing we're gonna do, make our little marinade paste. Got some garlic here. Ooh, we'll throw some lemongrass in there, some shallots, chilies, MSG. And then we're gonna make this into a little mash. 
Yeah, that's beautiful. Fish sauce in there. Put it right into here. Make sure it's coated really well. Grab our skewers. Oh, this is the perfect snack. <laughs> and this is an ode to the Minnesota State Fair. Everything on a stick. So you have cooked probably for thousands of people, at least in your life, but this is gonna be your first time cooking for a Hmong person in Laos. And I'm nervous because of the way that we cook in America. Hmong food is a little different than here in the mountains. I wanna see this guy's reaction. Let's go for it. Mmm, oh. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I asked him, I said, hey, is it really good or are you just being nice? And he's like, no, it's really good. Oh, this is delicious. It's so meaty, it's so tender, and it's so key the way you cooked it, because just visually, I would have been tempted to cook it more when you bite into it. It's so juicy. Has he had this version of heart before? First time like this. Cool. What do they usually do with the heart? They would steam it or braise it. Right on, that's awesome. Man, that's so exciting. I want to ask you more about your cooking history. When did you first start cooking? I mean, like every Hmong kid grows up cooking, right? You're, you're part of the house. Around this village, we see it's like all the little kids are all helping. But I think like professionally, 16, 17, I started working in kitchens and I never really wanted to do it because I always just thought that, oh, this is not something I want to do, it's so hard. But it was probably not until like 10, 12 years ago. Was there a moment when you decided, I want to be a chef, this is what I want to do? I don't think that I really had a moment where it was like, hey, I want to be a chef, I want to be a cook. I got really deep into it and I'm like, well, this is the way. <laughs> Today's main course begins with a tantalizing soup, then a sizzling stir fry of buffalo meat and a pot brimming with buffalo organs, along with every other last little bit of that colossal animal. When it comes to the idea of preserving Hmong culture, where does cooking fit into that? Our food is our story. It's our cultural DNA. And so to know our people, you have to know our food first because all our stories of who we are, where we've been, is in our food. This is absolutely a first for me. Are these missiles? Oh, these are mortars left over from the war here. These are dropped from airplanes and some of them just don't blow up. This is a mortar that we decommissioned and broke down and now we're using it as our stove. During the Vietnam War, Laos suffered in silence as the US military covertly bombed its land for over a decade. The relentless bombings aimed to disrupt the supply routes of the North Vietnam communists, turning Laos into the most heavily bombed country per capita in the history of warfare. So the biggest issues that we have in Laos is children going around playing and they find one of these things and it looks like a toy for them. And that's how many children either lose limb or die. Though better late than never, the USA has been assisting the Laos government in removing unexploded ordinances that still exist in this land. Before we get back to cooking, we'll sample a dish that requires no heat at all, raw buffalo lard. Made with raw cuts of meat, raw cuts of liver, and one special ingredient to blend them all together. Buffalo bile juice, extracted straight from the bile sack. Add MSG, rice powder, coriander, chilies, ground pepper, and mint. What's missing now is like the beer and the booze, because now is when I could really use it. Oh. Oh my gosh. Mm. Wow. That's a hard one. One thing I can say about Hmong folks, especially here, they do not make bland food. Mm -mm. The bile, it's like putting a battery on your tongue. Yes, you get that numbing sensation. It feels electric. What do you think of this? I'm good. That's it. Good. It's really strong for me, man. This is woof, potent. Please. Watch out, watch out. He says thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. No, ocho, ocho. Joining us again, our shaman friend. <laughs> and Mr. Kamar Song. Thank you so much for providing the buffalo. Oh, yeah. And he said that to see the full effect of the village, it's during the New Year's, but now everyone's got something to do today. Absolutely. You know, I wanted to speak to you just from your experience, from the time you were much younger until now. How have you seen this place change? <laughs> He said when he started out as a boy here in 62, there were only five families in this village. There was no trails here, there was nothing, but now there are roads that cars can come here. They have electricity here and they can harvest, they can garden, they can do all these different things. <laughs> from his generation to the next younger generation, are some of those traditions fading or disappearing? Some of the basic traditions that we've experienced today, they've held on to really tight. But then there are some things where it's just wrong and those we can let go. He says back in his day, if a man wanted a woman and said, hey, you're pretty, I want you, you just grab her arm and say, you're coming with me. But they don't do that anymore. Miss those days. <laughs> this morning's sacred beer-fueled ceremony 
was only the first among many. Now, the village chief invites his ancestral spirits to drop by the house. Empty chairs stand as seats for the visiting spirits, while the offerings are symbolically served as a sign of gratitude and respect for those who have passed. But life is also for the living. Okay, so we're coming over here. Yeah, got it. Okay. So, super grateful you're here. Yeah. And I know that if I've learned anything from Hmong people, whether it's in Minnesota or here, it's that the Hmong culture is so much about family. Mm -hmm. And so, we were able to get in contact with your mom's cousin. Are you being serious right now? And bring her here. Are you being serious right now? To join us for today's meal. Oh, Nyeongha. Nyeongha. Mr. Nao Young, along with his wife, Ms. Fowa. He's tall, huh? <laughs> After the war, countless Hmong families were split up for many reasons. Some opted to relocate to other countries, while others resiliently stayed behind, determined to rebuild their lives with whatever remained. Yi's cousins chose to stay, while the rest of his family sought a new beginning in the USA. In that time of war, when families split up, like if one of the fathers passed away or something, the other family would just bring that family in to be them. So it's cousins, but they see it as sisters. With a successful reunion accomplished, only two dishes remain before the village meal can begin. In a giant pot, chunks of buffalo meat and bones, both large and small, simmer together. But the secret to this one particular dish lies in the buffalo blood, imparting its own unique flavors. Add salt, MSG, passion fruit leaves, and leave it to simmer for hours. In a separate cooking pan, a new dish takes form, beginning with the sizzle of oil and garlic, followed by a generous portion of bite-sized buffalo meat slices. Fry them to perfection, infusing the flavors with salt, onion, MSG, ginger, and fragrant lemongrass. Thank you so much for joining us. So excited that everything happened so perfectly. The, the enthusiasm in this village is wild. It's electric, you can feel it in the air. Well, first of all, people have been drinking since 9 a.m. and that always helps. Luckily, it's only 2.49 right now. We're eating and drinking at very odd hours today. Here we have the stir fry. Yep. Mm. This stir fry is incredible. It's very lean, and so it's not intrinsically soft. That's why it's important, I think, to get a perfect thin slice yeah. so you can still get through it. And then you just chomp into these veggies that release so much fragrance. That herb, it really mellows out the gaminess, if you want to call it that, right? Mm -hmm. We don't shy. Mm. Oh, no. What? Are those roots or mice? Yeah. Yes. It's roots. They said that this will make you strong. Cool. How is it? <coughs> Good. <laughs> Finally, we've got this right here. This is the broth. This is that big cauldron that was being cooked on that mortar. Oh, and so this is part of the spine right here. Yep. Oh, or the, huh? What part is that? Some kind of a tubing. I feel like that we should have put that back in. Look at this. This is like a piece of a hip bone, maybe? Oh, you can peel it right off. Oh, there you go. Oh, and it's tender. I love it. Mm. As a kid, my favorite thing was to grab all the bones from the stock and just put a big bowl and just chip at it with a bowl of rice and some hot peppers. Oh, that sounds delightful. Every bite has a little bit different personality here. Some of the fats and connective tissues have rendered down. They become a little bit softer. Some parts are a bit chewy still, but it's packed with flavor. He wants to know if American people likes this kind of food. What would you say? Probably not the majority of them. It would depend on which thing you're talking about. Because we have like beef stews and stuff like that. But like nobody wants to eat it off the bone though. No, I couldn't see that happening. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've been in Asia too long. Have they been to the U.S.? Haven't. What's your impression of what Americans are usually eating? Oh, southern show. Most of what they've known of American food is from YouTube. He hasn't been to America, but he's been to France. So he's thinking that a lot of American food revolves around bread, cakes, you know, pastries. Uh, in many ways, he's correct. Yes. <laughs> For you, looking at this story from your father to where you're at now, your father came from here, your mother came from here. They made unimaginable sacrifices. Eventually, he moved to the USA along with you. And when we're talking about preservation of culture and tradition, it's just like he never could have imagined that those actions back then would culminate in you opening your own restaurant, going on shows like mine, on TV, being able to share this small piece of culture, this culture that could have easily have just been left and isolated in these mountains. That is being shared worldwide now.
through our food, our platforms of media or whatever, we get to keep sharing our parents' story. And that's what really excites me, man. Like we could have done this show from Minneapolis. You know, we have totally different when my feet is on the same dirt that my parents call home, a home that they might not be able to come back to. For you, where do you want to see Hmong cuisine in the future? I want the next generation of Hmong chefs and cooks to take that and they put their own story on it. And I really learned in the last 38 years what it really means to be Hmong is one generation gives up a piece of themselves so that the next generation can take that and put a little bit in for the next generation. I'm so happy you accepted my invitation and I'm so happy we could travel Laos together and have this experience and I could see this country through your eyes. My mind is kind of blown. Probably six months from now, I'll finally just process all of this. Oh, absolutely. Hey, thank you so much, brother. Thanks for having me. Boom, that is the end of video five and the end of our journey here in the country of Laos. Yeah, what do you think? It was amazing. Lifetime opportunity and this isn't my last trip here. I'm gonna come back. Oh, I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. I want to say a huge thank you to this man right here for joining me on this journey. It wouldn't have been the same at all without you. And I, honestly, I would not have wanted to do it if you weren't here. So thank you. I appreciate that, dude. You can go find Yia Vang right here on his Instagram. Follow him in his fun culinary pursuits, adventures, and media exploits and beyond. Otherwise, guys, that is it for this one. Signing out from Laos. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Peace. I saw a turkey over dude, there. Dude, there's a, like a I legit turkey. We could cook that turkey. Yeah. Thanksgiving. Over firewood. In Southeast Asia. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>